Amen. Anyone excited for Christmas? I want to invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 48. Genesis chapter 48. Two more messages till we conclude the study of the book of Genesis today and then the final message on the 31st of December. Genesis chapter 48. Genesis chapter 48. As you're turning there, chapter 47 Verse 9, we see that Jacob is standing before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh asks him, how old are you? Anybody recently been asked how old you are? And you're like, how do I answer this? Which way do I go here? Up or down? You know what I'm saying? Uh, and, or, or you're wondering, why are they asking me? <laughs> so uh, Jacob, standing before Pharaoh, how old are you? And he says this in verse 130. He says, my days have been few and hard. Some of you can relate, right? Some of you can relate. My days have been few and, and hard. Then in verse 28, we see that Jacob's lifespan is 147 years. 147 years. Now, his father Isaac was 180. His grandfather Abraham was 175. His great grandfather Terah was 205, and what we're going to see moving forward in Exodus is a shift in longevity. There's a shift in, in longevity. See, the pre-flood or the antediluvian men lived longer lives. Adam, for example, 930 years. Methuselah, the oldest, recorded at 969 years. But starting with Moses and onward... The average lifespan is around 70 years. Psalms chapter 90 verse 10 says this. Our lives last 67 years. Or if we are strong, 80 years. Even the best of them are struggle and sorrow. Indeed, they pass quickly and we fly away. Close last week's message with the first 17 years of Joseph's life, his father Jacob nurtured him, cared for him, provided for him, protected him. The final 17 years of Jacob's life, his son Joseph will now do the same. Nurture him, care for him, provide for, for him. What, what I hope that we will see come alive in the scriptures today is that no matter where you find yourself, that there is hope in Christ Jesus. There is hope in Christ Jesus. There is hope in sight with the birth of Christ. Amen? Chapter 48, verse 1. Sometime after this, Joseph was told, sometime after this, what's just happened? Look back. Look back to see what has taken place. We see that Jacob calls Joseph in and he makes a promise. He makes Joseph make this promise that when he does pass, that Joseph will take his body to be laid with Abraham and Isaac. And so sometime after this, this, this conversation, this, this pact, Joseph was told, your father is weaker. So he set out with his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. When Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. Summoned his strength, sat up in bed. Jacob, verse 3, said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And so here we have Jacob. Jacob is on his deathbed. He's on his deathbed. Joseph is told that his father is getting weaker, and so he comes with his two sons. He comes with his two sons. He gathers around. Jacob gets the strength to sit up in bed, and then he recalls to Joseph what happened in Genesis chapter 28. Do you remember what happened in Genesis chapter 28? Jacob is alone in ancient Luz, and he has this this dream. And in this dream, God promises Jacob three things. God promises Jacob 
that he will be present, his presence. God promises, God promises Jacob his presence, his protection, and his provision in Genesis chapter 28. God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. What we also must note before he begins blessing the sons in chapter 49 and we continue chapter 48 is that much of Jacob's life, it was all about him. Do you recall the different times where he noted, why are you bringing all this trouble on me? Any parents out there, you ever said that? To, you know, about your kids? <laughs> you know, there's a couple of you. You don't even need to raise your hand, you know? Uh, but, but, but at least two times that we know of, Chapter 34, chapter 43, Jacob has shouts this out. Why? Why have you caused this trouble on, on me? And so we know that, uh, at least in the beginning phases, the beginning parts of Jacob's life, uh, it was very uh, me-centric. It was Jacob was focused on, on him, him, himself. But in the latter part of his life, he focuses on the blessings of God. Now, there's an encouragement to a younger generation here to don't wait till the latter part of your life to be thankful for the blessings of God or to live out the obedience in your life. Don't wait. Don't wait till you say, I, I, when I retire, when I retire, then, then, then I will begin. I'll have more time. No, no, no. You have all the time you have right now to live for the glory of God. Don't miss this moment. We're not promised tomorrow. Don't, don't wait. In the latter part of his life, he recalls that God Almighty appeared to him at Luz, land of Canaan, and blessed him. Verse 4, he said to me, I will make you fruitful and numerous. I will make many nations come from you. And I will give this land as a permanent possession to your future descendants. I will give this land as a permanent possession to your future. And so here in verse 4, we see two things. God's promise to Jacob was firstly a people. Would you write that down? It was a people. Do you see what he says in verse 4? I will make many nations come from you. Now last, last week we noted that there were 70 people, 70 persons, chapter 46, verse 27, that came from the land of Canaan down to Egypt. And they were preserved they were preserved as this famine grew more severe. Praise God for his sovereignty over all things. There was this people. God's promise to Jacob was a, a people. If you recall, the 70 people over 400 years would grow. They would become numerous. And by the time the Lord raised up Moses to lead his people in what is called the Exodus in the account of the book of Exodus, this number has grown to some 600,000 men, not counting women and children. Somewhere around 2 million, 2.1 million that started with 70. Church, our God keeps his promises. Our God always keeps his promises. Note the second promise. God's promise to Jacob was not just a people. But the second promise was a place. It was a place. He says a permanent possession. The land. It's, it's God's land. Promised to Abraham and his descendants. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 verse 7. Now there's this, there's this picture that I want you to see. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, uh, but this picture is the speck of Israel. The picture is the speck of Israel. And then the surrounding nations are in, are in green. And, and so uh, do we have that picture? Do we have that picture? No, we don't have that picture. Awesome. Fantastic. And so uh, just imagine with me. Just imagine with me. Just imagine with me. The, the, the nation of Israel is this, this little speck surrounded by the nation of Israel. If you know any geography people in the room. Okay. Uh, you can also, if you're online with this and you're, you're listening. Okay, there's no geography people either. We're in trouble. Okay, there's three. We got three geography people. Uh, all right, we're really in trouble. And so just, just note, here's, here's, what, here's, here's what we're trying to say. 
is that the speck of land, it's God's promised land, and the land surrounding, the land surrounding, the nation surrounding throughout history have tried to take God's promised land. Now, this gift was an unconditional covenant. Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. Would you write that, that reference down? Genesis 17, verse 8. And to you and your offspring, I will give the land where you are residing, all the land of Canaan as a permanent possession, and I will be their God. I will be their God. Now listen, God has the sovereign right to choose who he wants. The land was promised to Isaac, not Ishmael. And what do we know? What we know is that the descendants of Ishmael were the, the Arab people, the, 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 the Islamic people, all these surrounding nations of this tiny piece of property. But in God's sovereignty, the land was promised to Isaac, not Ishmael. The land given to Jacob, not Esau. Zechariah chapter 14, a minor prophet says this, the nations of the world will fight against Israel. The nations of the world will fight against Israel. And you might be wondering today which nations have fought to take Israel, which, which nations have fought to take this land that God promised to his people, uh, which nations, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestinian Authority, Egypt, uh, Yemen, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, former Soviet Union, Morocco, Algeria, have all fought to take this, this land, this little piece of land. When you have all the surrounding land, they want that little piece of land that God promised Abraham that was passed down to Isaac, that was passed down to Jacob, and now Jacob will pass down to his, to his sons. Uh, you also might be wondering, if not the nations, which, which groups have tried to uh, uh, take this, this, this land, the evil, uh, radical terrorist groups such as the ALA or the Arab uh, Liberation Army, the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, Jamul, Lebanese National Resistance Front, Amel, the Lebanese militia, Hezbollah, Lebanese Shia militant group, UNLU, the Unified National Leadership of the Uprising, and most notably because of the news and the current situation is Hamas, Islamic Resistant Movement. You consider the wars, just this little piece of property, you consider the, 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 the wars since the rebirth of the nation of Israel. By the way, only 76 years, the, the, the state of Israel, the state of Israel just celebrates 76 six years. But, but you consider the, consider the rebirth of the nation of Israel, 19, uh, and the wars just since this rebirth, 1947 through 1949, we have the War of Independence. Uh, 1956, the Sinai War. 1967, the Six-Day War. 1967 to 1970, the War of Attrition. Uh, 1973, the Yom Kippur War. 1978, Operation Litany. 1982 through 1985, the First Lebanon War. 1985 to 2000, the Security Zone Campaign. 1987 to 1983, the First Intifada. I have my words, words. 2000 to 2005, the second, that word. The 2006, second Lebanon war. 2008 to 2009, Operation Cast Lead against Hamas. 2012, Operation Pillar of Defense against Hamas. 2014, Operation Protective Edge against Hamas. 2021, Israel-Palestine crisis against Hamas. 2023, what we know right now, Operation Swords of Iron against Hamas. Hamas. All these wars just in the past 76 years. Why? To take this land that God promised. That God promised to Abraham. That was passed down to Isaac. That was passed down to Jacob. And that was passed down to the descendants of, of, of Jacob. Look back to the text. Chapter 48. Again, God's promise to Jacob was a people and a place. Look back to verse 5, chapter 48. Your two sons born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are now mine. Ephraim and Manasseh belong to me just as Reuben and Simeon do. Children born to you after them will be yours and will be recorded under the names of their brothers with regard to their inheritance. 
When I was returning from Padan to my sorrow, Rachel died along the way, some distance from Ephrath in the land of Canaan. I buried her there along the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And so he, he, he brings these, the, the two sons, Joseph brings his, his two sons. And Jacob does this remarkable thing where he blesses these two sons as if they're his own. He blesses these two sons as if they're his, his own. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? And Joseph said to his father, they are my sons. God has given me here. So Israel said, bring them to me and I will bless them. Now his eyesight was poor because of his old age. He could hardly see. Joseph brought them to him and he kissed and embraced them. I'll pause just for a moment and, and consider. Consider Jacob in the state where because of old age, his eyesight is gone could barely make out who they are. And I just, I just wonder, as we're reading the text, I just wonder if he recalls in this very moment when he deceived his father Isaac to receive that blessing, that, that blessing from his father. In that moment, I just, I just, it's just a side note, but I just, I, I wonder, I wonder. And again, the, the main focus uh, to me of this entire text is this, that no matter your past, no matter your mistakes, that there is hope in Christ Jesus. There was hope for Jacob. Even on his deathbed, there was hope as he passes down these blessings to his sons. There's, there's hope. If, if there was hope for Jacob, you better believe that there is hope for me and, and you. Look back to verse 11. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, but now God has even let me see your offspring. Then Joseph took them from his father's knees and bowed with his face to the ground. I mean, could you just imagine this moment? For 22 years, he hadn't seen his son. For 22 years, he wondered if his son was still alive. And this is what he says. I never expected to see your face again. But now God has even let me see your offspring. Can you just let that sink in just for a moment? I never expected to see you again. But not only do I get to see you again, and he had these 17 years, but he gets to see his, his two, Joseph's two sons. Verse 13, then Joseph took them both with his right hand, Ephraim to, toward Israel's left and with his left hand Manasseh toward Israel's right and brought them to Israel. But Israel stretched out his right hand and put it on the head of Ephraim the younger and crossing his hands put his left on Manasseh's head although Manasseh was the firstborn. Then he blessed Joseph and said the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. The angel who has redeemed me from all harm. May he bless these boys and may they be called by my name. In the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And may they grow to be numerous within the land. Oh, how important our words are. Certainly in this moment on his deathbed, how important these last words are. But, but do you hear what he's recalling in verse 15, in verse 15, do, do you hear? He says, my shepherd all my life, my shepherd all my, my life. Jacob recognized that every day had been under the, the mighty hand of God's protection. The mighty hand of God had, had, had protected him. What does the shepherd do but protect his sheep, provide for his sheep? And even on his deathbed, he's acknowledging how the Lord has been the shepherd all his life. What a blessing to Joseph's sons and to Joseph that Jacob is acknowledging in part of his final words that there's only one shepherd and it is the Lord his God. There's hope for us today. I don't know what that need is that you're wrestling with, or you're trusting God for, but you, would, would you rest in the truth that he is our shepherd. 
He is your shepherd. You see in verse 16, he says, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm, redeem me. Now, this is the first mention, the first mention of God as redeemer, as God as deliverer, as God as his, as his savior. And I wonder, who is the Lord to you? Who is the Lord to you? Just take a step back and, and consider this, not just like what, what you've grown up hearing, but what you believe to the core. Who is the Lord to you? There is hope in him. There is hope in in the Lord. We see in verse 17, Joseph saw that his father had placed his right hand on Ephraim's head. He thought it was a mistake. He thought it was a mistake. And so what does Joseph do? He tries to change over the hands. <laughs> and, and, and Jacob's like, no, 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 no. Uh, I'm not blessing. Uh, the, the, I'm going to bless both, but it won't be the, the firstborn like you think it should be. And, and so he tries to, to, to move it. He ends up blessing both of them. And what's interesting is what we, what we will see once these tribes leave after 400 years, we'll see an establishment of Joseph's sons as part of the 12 tribes. There, there's a, there should be, hopefully there is a screen that you can see this, the 12 tribes. You see the 12 tribes, uh, you might need to pull out some binoculars, uh, but, but you see the 12 tribes and part of the 12 tribes, you won't find Joseph on there, but you'll find Joseph's two sons on there. And you won't find Levi on there, but you will find Simeon. And so this blessing is being passed down from Jacob on his deathbed to Joseph's two sons. No, one's last words are, are important. Words are obviously important. But there, there is something about last words. And, and this was Jacob's last significant act. As, as patriarch, as the heir of Abraham and Isaac. And here what we're going to see in chapter 49, in chapter 49 what we're going to see is that he prophesied blessings upon each son one by one, one by one. And as we look at chapter 49, I want to challenge you, I want to challenge you to consider your life. As we look at each blessing that Jacob gives to each of these sons, I want to challenge you to consider, consider your life. And if there was hope for Jacob's sons, you better believe that there is hope for me and you. There is hope for me and you. And so Jacob called, called his sons and said, gather around. These are the final words. So I will tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. And so they gathered. They're listening. Look at verse 3. The blessing to the first son. Reuben. You are my firstborn. My strength. And the first fruits of my virility. Excelling in prominence. Excelling in power. Turbulent as water. You will not excel. I mean it's going good. Right? <laughs> Can you imagine being Reuben in that moment? I mean hey. This is good, man. This is good news. I'm feeling good about me. And then, the, then he switches gears, right? Do you see it? Turbulent as water, you will not excel because you got into your father's bed and you defiled it. He got into my bed. Oh, yeah, I remember that, that one time. <laughs> Could you imagine being Reuben? Be as turbulent as water, he will not excel. And what we know is that the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Reuben never did excel. We don't see one judge come from that tribe. We don't see one prophet come from that tribe. We don't see one king come from, from the tribe of, of Reuben. Reuben. Reuben's immorality with his father's concubine Bilhah, who was the mother of Dan and Naphtali, is recorded in chapter 35. In verse 22, Charles Spurgeon once said, so a man may have great opportunities and yet lose them. Uncontrolled passions may make him very little who otherwise might have been great. Do you hear that? What does Jacob say? Those few last words to Reuben. He said, excelling in prominence. Excelling in power, 
turbulent as water, you will not excel. Imagine being Reuben in that moment, hearing and receiving the blessing from his father, Jacob. And again, as I ask you, consider your life. You consider your past, the failures and the mistakes, the sin against holy God and Jacob, even in his failure, being blessed. If there was hope, if there was hope for Reuben, you better be sure that there is hope for you and I. Look at verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their knives are vicious weapons. May I never enter their council. May I never join their assembly. For in their anger, they kill men. And on a whim there, they hamstring oxen. Their anger is cursed. For it is strong and their fury, for it is cruel. I will disperse them throughout Jacob and scatter them throughout Israel. The next two, Simeon and Levi. What did they do? They slaughtered. Do you recall that? They slaughtered the men at Shechem when they found out that these men had defiled their sister Dinah. This is chapter 34 of Genesis. And they went through and slaughtered all the men. They were fueled by anger. And that anger took over. Oh, we have to be careful to not give any foothold to the enemy who loves to fuel our anger. And next thing we know, we're making decisions that we're spending the rest of our lives. It seems they haunt us. Anger. Death. Murder. These two are receiving this blessing from Jacob. And there's hope for them. And I want you to hear today, what if your past, there's hope for you. In Christ Jesus, there's hope for you. Look at Judah, verse 8. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the necks of your enemies and your father's sons will bow down to you. Judah is a young lion. My son, you return from the kill. He crouches. He lies down like a lion or a lioness who dares to rouse him. Listen to verse 10. The scepter will not depart. The scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet until he whose right it is comes. And the obedience of the peoples belongs to him. He ties his donkey to a vine and the colt of his donkey to the choice wine. He washes his clothes in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth are whiter than, than milk. Judah, Judah. In a powerful way, this prophecy over Judah is a description of Judah's greatest descendant, Jesus. It's a description of, of Jesus. See, listen, the, the dying Jacob was speaking of his own son, Judah. But while speaking of Judah, he had a, a special eye to our Lord who came from the tribe of Judah. Everything which he says of Judah, he means with regard to our greater Judah, who is Jesus Christ our Lord. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. Jesus is called the Lion of Judah. You think about this description of wine. Before Jesus is crucified, in his last supper, he takes the, the wine and blesses it. And why do we do that? As a symbolic reminder of the precious blood that was shed for your sin and my sin. There is, there is hope in Christ Jesus. The next son we see in verse 13 is Zebulun. He will be a haven of, uh, for ships. He will be a haven for ships. Then it's uh, Issachar. Issachar will be a strong 
donkey. It will be a strong donkey. Issachar has demonstrated great physical strength, but lacks any will to use it for great purposes. He has this great strength, but he's just sitting back, lazy. Then we see Dan in verse 16. Dan will judge his, his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan will be a snake by the road, a viper beside the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider falls backward. Dan will be a snake by the road, Jacob prophesies in his, on his deathbed. Dan, we know, was a troublesome tribe. Dan introduced idolatry into Israel in Judges chapter 16, 18. Jeroboam set up one of his idolatrous golden calves in Dan in 1 Kings chapter 12. And later, Dan became a center of idol worship in Israel, Amos chapter 8. You fast forward, Jesus would lead his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, which would be in the region of of Dan. Caesarea Philippi was known for their pagan worship. I've been there. It's one of my favorite sites in Israel to visit. As I sit back and I consider the words of Jesus to Peter, and he says this, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not prevail. What is he talking about? All the different forms of false pagan practice will not pre prevail against the power of our God. There's hope. There's hope in the Lord. We see in verse 19 that God will triumph at last. We see, and most of us can relate with verse 20, Asher, he's going to eat well. Amen. <laughs> verse 21, Naphtali will be a key portion near the Sea of Galilee where much of Jesus' ministry and teaching took place. Look at Joseph. Verses 22 through, through 26. In words about Joseph, Jacob, Jacob listed five great titles for God. Do, do you see them? Mighty one, verse 24, mighty one of Jacob. The shepherd, the rock of, of Israel. Verse 25, the God of your father who helps you. And then the fifth title is the almighty. The almighty December 31st, our final Sunday of 2023, there's one gathering at 1030, and I'm going to preach the final message in the study of Genesis. It's been a long road, a uh, long journey, but we've, we've made it. <laughs> and the title of the, the message, the, the, the theme of the message is this, that Jesus is a better Joseph. There's so much emphasis on the accolades of Joseph that he was a man that never compromised and a man that never complained, that God did so much through him. But we're going we're gonna to see through the lens of who Jesus really is. That as good as Joseph was, we need one who is greater, and his name is Jesus. His name is, his name is Jesus. We see in verse 27 that, that Benjamin, the final blessing, was like a ravenous wolf. Some of you would appreciate that blessing, you know? Be a ravenous wolf. Here's what, here's what Charles Spurgeon once said. God uses people that fail because there aren't any other kind around. As we consider the lives of all these sons, go, go back and read through. You remember that at age 17, Joseph was going to check on the brothers. And the brothers, as they saw him from a distance, started plotting. They started, they started plotting. We're going to keep going. And we're going to try to keep going. Just saying, wrap it up. And you consider, you consider these, these brothers. You, you consider Jacob's sons and what they struggled with. Do, do you recall the envy, the rivalry, the deceit? Evil plotting, the murder, anger, and forgiveness. You, you consider their life. You consider your life. And again, if there was hope for Jacob's sons, hear me clearly today. There is hope for you 
and I. Paul Washer said this, a murderer, prostitute, thief, liar, fornicator, adulterer, etc. Apart from the grace of God, they are just a mirror of who we are. They're a mirror of, of who we are. This, this is what Christmas is really all about. Hope. You've heard the word Advent, I'm sure, time and time again. You've seen it. Advent means the beginning of an event, the arrival of a person. That's what Christmas is really all about. The beginning of an event. Without the birth of Jesus, we wouldn't have hope. Without the birth of Jesus, we wouldn't have peace. Without the birth of Jesus, we wouldn't have joy. Without the birth of Jesus, we, we wouldn't have love. Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says this. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow. This is good news, believer. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I don't know what... Uh, what you all are walking through today. I know what's before us. I know what's before us. What a great celebration, a, a great time to, to gather the, with, with, with some family, a, a great time to perhaps refocus before we begin a new year. But if I had to guess, many of you are facing some significant challenges, even perhaps some hopeless challenges, situations, and you need the one who gives hope to fill you today, to fill you up today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place? Those that are joining us online, would you get along with the Lord and would you ask him, God, what is my response in all of this today? What is my response in all of this today? As people are praying all across this place, you're just saying a simple prayer, God, what is my response? I wonder if there's someone here that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus for salvation, and today might be the day of salvation. Today might be the day that you reach out and you receive the greatest gift that is salvation in Christ Jesus. That gift is eternal life. That gift is forgiveness of all sins. No matter your mistakes, no matter your failures, the king has come. The king has come. The salvation is made available. There is hope. In Jesus Christ, there is hope. So as people are praying all across this place, I wonder if there's someone here never surrendered over to Jesus. Today would be the day that you say something like, Jesus, I am a sinner. You are the Savior. I trust in you completely. Forgive me of all my sins. I believe in you came to this earth, you died on a cross, you were placed in a grave, and you rose victorious for me. So I trust you. I trust you. Take my life. Use me for your glory. Would you thank him? If that's your prayer today, would you thank him? As some of you are struggling with hope, And right where you're at, whether you're in the house or you're alive, would you just say, God, fill me up with, with your hope. Fill me up with your hope today. Help me to put my eyes on you, Jesus. Help me to take every thought captive in obedience to following Christ. To replace every, every doubt, every fear to replace it with the truth of God's word. Would you allow him to do that today?
Lord Jesus, we come before you. We humble ourselves. We're thankful for how good and gracious you are. We're thankful that even when we miss it, you are good and you are faithful. We thank you, Lord, that you loved us so much that you stepped into this world, took on flesh and dwelt among us. We're thankful that you shed your precious blood on the cross and you didn't stay in that, that grave, but you rose victorious. And so, Father, I pray, I pray that each, each one in the house and each one alive would be filled up with hope today because there's hope in Christ Jesus. We thank you and we praise you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. We say amen, amen.